Why did you uh, pick classic literature to base your artwork on? The main reason was that I had all these experts telling me that, that my students wouldn't be able to handle these texts, these classics, that they wouldn't be able to comprehend them, that this is beyond their level. And that made me angry, because I just didn't believe it. And uh, I, so I said, by hook or by crook, we're going to have these books be part of our life. One of my great heroes is an American philosopher, African-American philosopher named W.E.B. Du Bois. And he says in Souls of Black Folks, I sit beside Shakespeare, and he winces not. Shakespeare, I, I just got finished teaching at Harvard, and I just told those folk right there, Shakespeare didn't write just for comparative literature students at Harvard, huh? and he didn't just write for rich folk. He wrote for the ages, and, and son, he wrote for you and your generation, because you know, a lot of you know this, especially in the Bronx, um, tragedy is not an aesthetic category for us that we admire. We know what that means. We know what comedy means, because I've seen you all act out. Right? So uh, it's just having that connection of, of great literature because th those are the big issues that are in our life and, it's, and they're quite universal. And there's something just so powerful about being in communion with, with these great, great writers and these great, great issues and these great themes. What is your process like in creating the art? The process? Um, wow. Basically, you know what happens is that I get an intuition. I get a feeling when I encounter a new work of literature, when I'm researching ideas. It depends on maybe something's going on in the lives of some of us in the group, and so maybe that reminds me of, of, of something. But what's interesting is that we've never done a book that I was familiar with. So what I happen to do is, is I get uh, research and I start reading, and if I get excited, and if I catch on fire, then the whole studio catches on fire. Because there's a mystery. I mean, you know, this is a, an attempt to solve a genuine mystery. It's on A Midsummer Night's Dream after Shakespeare and, and Mendelssohn. And uh, what we want to know is that in the play, there is a flower, a magic flower that has the power to make you fall in love with the next living thing you see upon awakening. And the only person that can find this flower is a little knucklehead named Puck. And Puck is the artist spirit. And so I'm asking everybody if you could portray that flower in watercolor and mulberry paper, what would this magic flower look like? So that, and, and I don't know. I can't tell you, your art teacher can't tell you, your mother can't tell you. And so together, we start as a team, it's like an orchestra or a choir. We start riffing, as they say in jazz, and I, I got a little thing here. Then Robert says, oh, I can do better than that. You know? And then Rick goes, I'll do better than any of you. Boom, 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 boom and then the project just grows very organically. And it's over a long period of time, trust me. Uh, it, sometimes it'll happen in a week or a month. Uh, lots of times it takes two to three to four years to get an idea. And then once we get the idea and learn the craft and the technique and, know, and get our materials together and get the scale of it, then it tends to just flow beautifully. But it takes a long time to get that, that initial spark going. Are there any ideas that haven't been turned into a work For years, I've been looking and reading Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, and I don't know why. And we haven't gotten it yet. And sometimes we'll be washing brushes, or just you know eating lunch together, or just walking down the street, and then one of us will go, "Wait a minute!" And I call that the Eureka moment. What about this? And what if we try this? And what if we try this? And uh, it becomes obvious everyone, again, starts riffing on it until we get something that is very um, commanding and powerful and convincing. Uh, how does the literary work affect which materials you use for all of we, we, I always say, say to the, the participants, don't illustrate this text or this music. Don't do that because it's, it's not what we're going for. We want to be inspired by these, these texts, but we don't want to just illustrate them. We want to come up with what we call a visual correspondence, something that captures the spirit of the text, something that engages with the issues of the text. But people, sometimes they'll come and they'll look for a very literal, I don't know, 
interpretation of what we're doing on the text, and we are literary, but we don't want to be literal. We want to have something that has some mystery. We want to have, have something that you complete in, in your spirit and in your mind when you encounter the work in a gallery or museum or in a public place. As you're doing your artwork, do you control the paintbrush or is the paintbrush control you? Oh, very good. No, I always do this. I, I say, no, the, the paintbrush controls me. Um, lots of times I'll get, especially fifth graders, little younger ones, and they kind of stare in the space. They don't know what to do. And I say, come here. And I say, what, what's, I'm on the blackboard. What's this? It's a blackboard. What's this? A piece of chalk. And what is this? Blackboard. What is this? A piece of chalk. You know? And I go watch. And I stare in the space, and I just start. And I lose myself, and I listen to the voice that tells me where to go. And I say, can I ask you a question? What? Does this chalk know what's moving it? Now, you become the chalk. You have what, the, um, the oomph moment, what was it? What is it? The, the eureka, eureka moment. moment. Jamel Shabazz had the decisive moment, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, how do you know when something feels right? Like, what's the gut instinct? Like, I, it's really hard like, to understand some of the artwork that you put together. Like, I know it's based on passive literature, but mm -hmm. what's that? What's that? Can you explain the feeling that you get, like, when you know it's uh, you th Yeah. Piece, that, you know it's gonna be boom. That's you know? Like, emerald, boom. You just you nail it. And we got it. And then what we do is we say, OK, let's not party yet. Let's not celebrate yet. Let's keep making a lot of these things. We make a whole lot of trash to get to the treasure. Our, mo our most important uh, uh, instrument in the studio is the garbage can. And we work our way through all these experiments in order to get something that is convincing and says, yeah, this has power, this has mystery. This is something I've been wanting to look at for a long time, and hopefully other people will as well. It becomes quite obvious. And especially since we're a collaborative team, it isn't just me saying, oh, that's great. Because sometimes you know, I'll say, wow, this is great. And Rick will go, are you kidding? And this is so corny. And, and so we bounce back and forth. But when we feel it together as a team, you just know you, you, we, we nailed it. And then, and then, and then we can um, put it out into the world and see if it can survive without us telling everyone how great it is.